Yeah, Michael Woolman is, is our advisor. I was talking uh, kind of along a very similar line of research. So uh, I'm going to talking about how we can use EGTA to do mechanism design for frequent call markets. If you're not familiar with frequent call markets, there are a recent proposal for a new uh, mechanism for modern financial exchanges and to kind of explain why you should even care about why they exist. I'm going to give you a little background about uh, kind of how current financial markets are structured. So this plot is the price of uh, essentially the S&P 500 for a day in trading. Uh, the, the blue is in New York and the green is in Chicago, I believe. And all you should see is that uh, for the most part, they're exactly the same. Uh, they're shifted by 10 points, but basically they're almost perfectly correlated, which you should expect since they're roughly the same good. It shouldn't matter if you traded in a market in Chicago or a market in New York that they would have different prices. However, if we take this graph and we zoom in to a quarter of a second, you see that basically all of that correlation goes away and these look like two almost completely uncorrelated signals. And this fact is a result of modern financial markets using continuous matching. So as soon as you submit an order to buy uh, on a financial exchange, if anyone else is willing to trade with you, you'll trade and shift to the price. However, since New York and Chicago are physically separated, uh, it actually takes about three milliseconds to communicate information between them uh, via like a direct exchange uh, at the speed of light. So you can't actually keep these markets completely matched. And if you have any experience with trading the same good on two different markets, if you see mispricings like this, there's an obvious solution is you arbitrage them. Uh, and in fact, this is done today with a trading strategy that is known commonly as latency arbitrage. Basically, financial exchanges that pay for really, really fast access between two different markets, like New York and Chicago, or uh, New York and London, will arbitrage these very small millisecond long price discrepancies to turn a profit. Now, in general, arbitrage isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can make markets more efficient. But in fact, there are several papers that have come out over the past maybe, say, five years that kind of all point to latency arbitrage being bad for markets overall. Things like reducing surplus, increasing spreads, uh, lowering liquidity, all things that you tend to not want in a market. So one possible solution that's been proposed is to switch to a frequent call market. Uh, if you're not familiar, a frequent call market's a pretty simple idea. Instead of transacting as soon as orders arrive into the market, you instead now aggregate them over a clearing interval, say something on the order of a second, and then match supply and demand and find a clearing price. Uh, by doing this, you, um, yeah, well, so why, uh, and yeah, these frequent call markets only expose information over the course of a clearing interval. So why should, like, how does this actually help? Um, uh, so why should we actually focus on these clearing markets as opposed to other techniques that might also solve latency arbitrage, like potentially taxing cancels or looking at uh, other ways that you might prevent this predatory behavior? Uh, one is that it simply removes the speed advantage. If you're aggregating all orders over the course of a second, if you have a one millisecond speed advantage, there's now only a one millisecond window that you can react to information. So implicitly, this simple mechanism, mechanism change eliminates a lot of the gain that you get from any uh, speed advantage of requiring the same information. The second, and this is a little bit more subtle but along the same lines, is that it forces competition over price instead of time. So in a continuous market, if you beat, if your order, if your order reaches the matching engine before someone else's order, you transact independent of what price you set as long as you're willing to transact. But in a batched auction like this, if you don't, if both orders arrive within the clearing interval, now whoever has the more favorable, favorable price will transact. So as soon as there are two exchanges that are both trying to compete over fast access, they now also have to compete on the price that they trade at. So you get more efficient pricing. Uh, finally, because you're batching a lot of orders at the same time, you get aggregated price information. So instead of uh, matching as orders come in, which may vary a lot due to kind of order arrival, due to any number of situations, you get uh, matched uh, supply and demand over the course of the clearing interval. So you're going to get better pricing, more efficient matchings. Uh, in addition, there are a lot of practical reasons as to why this mechanism makes a lot of sense for implementing in current financial markets. For one, it's a very simple mechanism, right? Instead of matching as they come in, you can wait a second and then you match all of the orders that would that came in that second and you move on. So it's not 
don't have to deal with as much strategic reasoning about how much you're going to be taxed and how much profit you need to make off of a trade and how you adjust pricing to be strategic. It's literally just delaying trade by a little bit. Second, uh, there's a paper uh, by Buddha Crampton and Shim that kind of outlines how these kind of markets would already be implemented in our current financial system and how they would comply with a lot of modern financial regulations. So there's already kind of prior work on how you would implement something like this. There are a few studies that have looked at how they would coexist and how you would already get agents to migrate from current continuous exchanges to uh, new kinds of batched exchanges. And they've even been partially implemented, I think, on the order of like six months to a year ago, the Chicago Exchange implemented, implemented what they call snap auctions, which is an agent-initiated half-second clear in an otherwise normal continuous auction. So you can kind of send a special message to the exchange that says for the next half-second, aggregate all of the orders, and then do, a, do an auction as we described that would reappear, reoccur uh, continuously throughout the interval. So, there's a lot of reasons for why these can and should potentially be implemented, but there's still one major question that has yet to really be answered, and that's how long should this interval be? I've thrown out kind of half second to second, but these are all you know, loose proxies for something that is reasonably long on the terms of high frequency trading and how fast you can communicate between exchanges, but relatively short for like human levels of information. A second, if you were gonna, if you wanted to go trade, you know, shares of Apple, having to wait an extra second to see if you transacted wouldn't really matter on a human scale. Uh, prior work has just decided to set this off of say, um, how would you, what, how long would you need this clearing interval be to be in order to stop latency arbitrage? So that's been the main motivator. So they were like, well, um, if latency arbitrage is bad and causes all these negative aspects of a market, how long should we set it to prevent that? But I think uh, that papers that have looked at proxies like this have really kind of missed out on an important aspect of changing a market mechanism, which is we don't need to just prevent latency arbitrage. Uh, we can actually optimize market performance. And so that's what the contribution of this paper is, is how do we set clearing interval in these frequent call markets in order to actually optimize aspects of a market that we care about? I mean, the reason why we don't like latency arbitrage is that it uh, makes markets perform worse. So why not take this to our full advantage? And so to do this, we're gonna use kind of modified standard mechanism design by analyzing how agents respond in uh, Nash equilibrium. The two, market performance metrics that we're going to look at are efficiency. So in other words, how well does the market do at allocating securities between agents? Um, and price discovery. So how closely does the price that agents transact at match the kind of underlying fundamental price that we're going to model in this exchange? Uh, and for our analysis, we're going to mostly ignore the direct aspects of latency arbitrage and instead focus just on what aspects of frequent call markets actually promote better market performance. So in some sense, you can view this as making a favorable comparison to continuous markets because their efficiency and price discovery won't be hurt by the presence of arbitrage, which the call markets naturally have more protection against. So I'm gonna quickly run through our model so that you kind of see how this works and then I'll get into our results. So we uh, model a finite number of risk neutral agents where in this case we'll look at more agents equating to a thicker market because there'll be more active trades and more orders in the, in the market. And our valuation function will have two components, a private and a common value. The private value is how we get agents to trade. You can look at this as a proxy for if they were risk averse or if they had desire to liquidate their uh, shares or kind of anything else that you want to use. This is kind of just a generic way to encapsulate desire for agents to trade in the model. And then we have a common value, which um, is just a time varying fundamental that we use to model adverse selection. So we'll change the way that this process evolves in order to increase or decrease the level of adverse selection that agents face. A more volatile fundamental is going to lead to agents having more risk from novel information later in time. The agents will come in to the market and they'll get kind of information at these random intervals and then they'll decide to trade off of that information and uh, to give agents some aspect of impatience, they're gonna be limited in how often they can trade. So if the clearing intervals are too long, they're not gonna have as many opportunities as they might otherwise desire. So the model as I describe it 
is uh, relatively complex in the same vein as Frank's talk, and that it's gonna be hard to analyze something exactly like this in a tractable analytic way. So instead, we're gonna discretize the strategy space according to kind of standard agent-based interactions for financial markets, and then use EGTA, this methodology for kind of computing approximate equilibria in these uh, simulation-based games in order to find approximate equilibria, and then analyze this over several environments in order to determine how uh, different aspects of market environments affect what an optimal clearing interval is for frequent call markets. And when we do this, that yellow doesn't really show up very well on this projector. Um, we find basically a result that we would expect, which is that you can, in some markets, set an optimal clearing interval that improves efficiency. What you'll see uh, on this chart without a laser pointer is that the CDA is relatively flat, but for a wide range of clearing intervals, the call market actually performs substantially better in terms of efficiency than the CDA, and that it's relatively robust. For, this is like a log scale, but for you know, the first 90% of this interval, the call market provides substantial efficiency benefit to the market, and it's relatively constant. At the end, this drops off, and this is due to a, a reason that I'll explain, which is, there are two major frictions in implementing a frequent call market in terms of efficiency. The first is that clearing intervals promote, promote more efficient trades, right? If you were to run a single clear and agents were to truthfully report, you'd have a perfect allocation because you could actually just match off of values. Now, obviously, any strategic interaction is going to decay this a little bit, but in general, if you're going to aggregate more agents' orders at a time, you're going to get a more efficient allocation. However, the major problem is that as you increase the clearing interval in our model and kind of in general, agents have to wait longer to trade. So too prohibitive, too long of a clearing interval becomes too prohibitive for fast transaction and is going to eliminate any benefit that agents were to get from efficient matching by making them wait too long in order to transact. So you see uh, in this environment, you get kind of the exact desired effect, which is for some moderate clearing interval, you get some advantage and then it tails off. But in, in particular, it's substantially more robust than we expected, at least in this model. Now I talked about this as a general situation, so what you might want to look at is actually how this varies over environments. And so here are four extreme environments that we analyze. There are, are more in the paper that I'll talk about, but this shows, I think, the general trend behind how these interact, and I, I really hope you can see the, the continuous market yellow line um, that's across there. The basic trend here is as you get more agents and as you get less adverse selection in the model, you get a much better benefit to switching to a, to a call market from a continuous double auction. And um, in particular, this, is, this was at least surprising for us because a general way to view call markets is that you get some aspect of protection, that by not revealing information and having a long period to clear, if you were trading in a thin market, you have the advantage of being able to submit an order and hopefully having someone else who's not going to take advantage of your order in the next uh, you know, second before it clears, and so maybe you'll get a more favorable price, that kind of this batching gives you more favorable trades, and that in the same vein, having lower, having higher adverse selection, again, the, the length of the call market kind of protects you from price shocks because people might submit to the market before they know about the price shock change or you might get kind of some protection in that case. But actually, if you, if you think back to the two frictions that we presented or that I talked about earlier, this does actually make sense, which is because you're batching over a set number of time, the more agents that you have in the market means that you're actually gonna get a better benefit to batching. You're gonna have an, out, the average number of agents who are participating in a single clear is gonna be larger, so it's gonna price better and therefore produce a better allocation, making a more efficient market. And along those same lines, if you have agents that came in at the beginning of an interval, uh, beginning of a clearing interval and submitted a bunch of orders, and then there was a large price shock because there's a lot of adverse selection, the ones at the end of the interval are gonna, are gonna take advantage of them. And so if you're in an environment that's gonna have a lot of adverse selection in equilibrium, you're gonna have to be more hesitant to trade in an interval, and so you're gonna get less efficient matching because agents have to more protect themselves from the risk of a price shock 
even during a long interval, because despite the fact that there's some agents to help them out, price shocks can still be relatively damaging. So we get this, what I believe is somewhat counterintuitive result, but very promising for implementation. The second uh, an aspect of market performance that we looked at is price discovery. So in this case, lower is better. And you see the general same result that we saw with efficiency, that for moderate call intervals, call markets ha can have significantly better price discovery, but as they get too long, then you get worse price discovery. And there are, uh, this is an explanation for this as well, obviously, which is that as you get a longer clearing interval, you reduce the variance of private value. So as I said, agents have private values when they trade in this model, and that private value is gonna impact what price they set because they're kind of gonna be willing to trade between how much they value the asset versus, let's say, the market price. And so if you have very few agents participating in a trade, then that private, the variance in their private values is gonna impact how far the price they trade at is from, let's say, the true uh, underlying fundamental price. But if you have a call market that's aggregating several agents uh, valuations at a time, they're going to trade much closer to what that actual uh, market value is. And as you increase the clearing interval, you now start to get much more stale information that's going to be taken into each, each batch. So when we get to the extrema of very long clearing intervals, then you get bad you get bad price discovery again. So there's like this sweet spot where the clearing interval is not too long and you get much more efficient markets, or much more well-priced markets. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over this slide, but you kind of see the same effects that you do with efficiency, which is just like efficiency, call markets benefit price discovery in thick markets with low adverse selection. Uh, before I conclude, we did one final look, which is that uh, the strategies that we implemented are all based off of, let's say, standard uh, market strategies, so they don't take into account the length of a clearing interval or what position you are when you trade. And so just to kind of see what effect, uh, in some sense, sniping has on these markets by looking at how, what if agents condition on where they arrive in a clearing interval. So if you arrive at the end, you can take advantage of the fact that people, most of the orders in the clearing interval came in with less information than you did. Um, but in fact, what we see is that there's relatively no effect. So the top two graphs are efficiency and price discovery with the standard set of strategies that I've kind of presented for the whole talk. And in the bottom are the same, but with the ability for agents to, in some sense, snipe. Agents that come at the end of the interval can uh, price adversarially. And qualitatively, there's basically no no real difference. So uh, on that, I want to conclude and just say that um, by using this methodology, we're able to find results that uh, indicate wh what type of markets call, uh, call markets should be implemented in, including uh, especially ones that have a large number of agents and low adverse selection, or in some sense, kind of information volatility. And this isn't subject to just the notion of uh, s simple market strategies. Uh, questions? Thank you.